Black Metal. Black Metal, the third record or the second record? Uh, I don't know. It was in 1982. Yeah, that's Black Metal. There, cause there's also a Metal Black that they did like right after Resurrection in the 90s. It's not that great. Yeah, this was the 1992. It's not awful. I got I only got a few tracks in. Which? Black Metal. You liked it? Well, it's it's not as bad as I I, I don't know. I guess everything I, I'm expecting everything to sound as bad as that first Carcass album. Well, the first Venom record was pretty bad. Like spilled coffee on the tape, bad. Uh, no, as in shouldn't be playing and putting out albums yet, bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who's to say that? Me. I'm but I, master butcher, motherfucker. I really liked Primeval. I knew that's you'd like album. that. That's what. That's the ones that Dustin likes because it has the other guy singing, Tony Dolan, Demolition Man. Yeah, he's great. He's a great singer. I mean, that whole album is just kind of that classic, kind of that era of metal where they're trying to find, almost like they're still trying to find that sound. You know what I mean? Where like some songs are almost like blues rock, you know, or or like Motley Crue kind of sounding, and then there's like straight up speed metal. Yeah, the venom. It's, it's a little bit all over the place, but I like it. So mentally challenged, it's J.R. Tarina, the master butcher, also known as Speed Racer, and Mark Racer X Hansen here. Oh, yes, indeed. We're here to finish. Talking about Venom today, possibly. Maybe do some more Judas Priest. Maybe jump into some Iron Maiden and a few more Outre 80s bands. Um, speaking of Outre, tell me what you think of this. I got a friend on Facebook. He's an LDS guy, you know, Mormon. Uh-huh. He's pretty funny. He's pretty, like, lenient, pretty, like, what would be the word? Uh, modern or, like... Hip yeah, laid back. Bit, you know? Yeah, whatever. So he posted something about a, a relationship that he had. So I chimed in and said, "Yeah, you know, I just broke up with my girlfriend. Funny you posted this. It was kind of good to hear." He's like, "Oh, dude, that's great, man." And like, "Yeah, screw her." And I said, "Not anymore," you know. And it was it was just yeah. to say. And like all of a sudden, like I was the post was gone. I tried to look it up again later that night. It was gone, or I was not allowed to see it. But usually the notice that comes up says something to the effect of uh, there's something wrong with this post, meaning that I had probably got blocked from it or something. But he's still my friend on Facebook. So I'm like, well, what the fuck? Was it because I said that? But I also said, uh, oh, we have the same point of view because you're a Mormon and I'm a heathen. And he knows I'm not. He knows I'm like into Satanism and stuff. And uh-huh. And we've been friends all these years. So I'm like, why the fuck would that happen? Did I offend everybody by saying, all his Mormon friends by saying, screw? Not anymore? I mean, really? I I doubt that. I, I have a feeling that he probably... So he just broke up, right, with a, a, a chick? Is that right? I don't know if it was just, but I mean, he just was posting something about a past female <laughs> that ripped him, I guess, or fucked him over. I, yeah, I'm guessing she probably saw it. I don't know. Possibly. That yeah, could be. I, I never thought of it like that, but I don't know. I, I wouldn't think so. Yeah. But, I don't know, that kind of pissed me off. And then also, I just found out that a childhood friend of mine died, but he had died a couple of years ago, but I just found out last night. <laughs> I was like, how, how did he die? I don't know. It's super mysterious. It was in Texas. It was like my childhood friend that lived across the street. We were the same age, and I... You know, I mean, we kind of grew apart while we were there. I, we started junior high at different schools, and uh, he was more like your basic Texan kid, went everywhere barefoot, liked to play in the, the ditch and just play baseball, and I was like more of like the Atari. Is you, you were talking about playing Atari? Yeah, I was saying my, my friend that had died was more like your average Texan kid that was totally into like sports and running around outside in your bare feet and all that kind of shit. And I was more like stay inside, play Atari, watch Buck Rogers on TV. So at any rate, I don't know what happened to him. It was he, we were the same age and he died a few years ago. So he would have been like 46 or 47, but there's no information anywhere online. And I'm just like, wow, that's kind of weird. I wonder what what happened if it was like something he did like drugs or if he was shot or if it was just natural causes but he wasn't he was pretty physically fit i mean COVID 19 
No, no, it was be- way before that. I mean, this is 2017 uh, when he died, so. Oh, we don't know. Yeah, it was the the Honda virus. Um, uh, I mean, you know, we're at that age, man, when uh, shit starts to fall apart, man. That's not true at all. And, you know, that reminds me. I wanted to bring that up. It's a good thing you said that. Is, uh, you were asking me last week about pointers on if you could shred or not because you're getting older. And uh, I yeah. didn't really answer your question, but my question or my answer is this. I think, yes, um, if you're abusive to yourself, like chemically or in other ways, then that's going to, of course, hamper your efforts. But you also have to keep in, like, physical shape. But at the same time, just because you're old or mm-hmm. older, or getting older, does not mean that uh, you're incapable of doing anything. Because I still do the same workouts, I can still... Yeah, could I could I bulk up? Could I build muscle at, at this age? Well, of course. Well, that's all. Okay, I, mean, I think I should be all right. There are guys at the gym, older than me, like white-haired guys who are just fucking beasts, like ripped, massive fucking... Not massive, but they're ripped, they're, just, they're fit. They're fucking you lean. Think they take them. steroids. Uh, I don't know. It's hard to say. Some or, guys, some guys just keep in shape, and they're really strict about dieting. Like I'm not a super strict dieter. I, I fucking, I'm Italian. I love chocolate, cheese, olives, salami. Oh yeah. I'll never give that shit up just to have a six pack. There's no reason to have a six pack. If you're gonna have a six pack, no, you're just trying to get laid at a club. That's it. Plain, or you're like impressing other men. There's, there's nothing else. Yeah. There's no fucking reason. There's, like, no, why there's no functionality like, to it necessarily. It's just so dumb. I'm like some of these guys that like just bust their asses at the gym and they have a six pack and they eat like, oh, I eat uh, shredded diapers and uh, egg whites and ch- plain chicken breast baked in the oven with no seasoning on it every day. That's all I eat in life. And I drink water and a protein shake. I splurge and have a protein shake on the weekend. I'm like, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's fucking awesome. So you can meet some club rat with like fake nails and fake eyelashes and fake tits and go home and fuck her and then she fucks you over in a couple of days. Uh huh. That's exactly what I fucking want to do. Sounds awesome. No, I'll yeah. tell you what I need. Um, so like, <laughs> like my calves are really cool. Like, cause I walk so much, like my calves are like really uh, defined and toned and pretty big. Cats, cats like your cats, they work out. Yeah, my cats. No you calves. Cat you know that the lower part of your leg. Oh, the calves. Jesus. You've got baby cows that work out. Yes. Yes. Jesus. Yeah, Christ. these aren't these aren't veal uh, calves. These are not calves. cage, cage awesome. fed. But but my uh, what's the muscle that's behind your leg but higher? The hamstring. Yeah, my hamstrings feel really, really weak. I think I have like a runner's build for some reason. So I've lost like a ton of weight. My arms are skinny now and I have no ass. So I need to get like, I want my upper half of my legs to bulk up and I need a, I need my ass back and then just a little bit of bulk of my arms. What do I do? Well, like how do I achieve that? How do I get my ass back? Your ass? Yeah, I need it. My ass is disappearing. If you want to work out the glutes, your your muscles that are in your ass cheeks, um, any number of exercises like squats. Yeah, I mean, and here's the thing too: when you work out, you don't have to go super heavy. You don't have to work out all fucking day. You don't have to go every day. Those are the three cardinal. Uh, I wouldn't do that anyways. You know, well, a lot of people don't work out because they feel like they have to do it religiously. Like, they'll, you'll go to the gym and see the same guys there, like, all night. You can go for, like, an hour a day, a couple of days a week, two, three, four days a week, whatever, between two and four days a week. For an hour, you can do lightweight. You don't have to do fucking crazy heavy. And just remember this. The heavier you go, the more muscle tissue you build. And the lighter weight you do, but more reps that you do, the more toned you get. More toned. So it's a trade-off, but if you eat a lot, like I do, like you tend to eat a lot of protein and carb and all that kind of stuff, which I do, like bread, potatoes, and meat, then, of course, you're going to pack on some more weight, especially if you have the fluffy stuff that, like, other people like, like milkshakes or ice cream, or, and I do love uh-huh. some fluffy stuff, too, so. So you'll gain weight, but you got to be careful, too, because if you're, you'll gain it, like, where you want it, but you'll also get it in other spots, too, where you kind of don't want it, so. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not too worried about that. Like, um, 
like I said, I, I, I walk so much that I, I don't think I, gaining weight is going to be a problem. I fa in fact, gaining weight is the problem. Like, I can't seem to put it on anymore. Like, Have you considered that you might have a tapeworm? No, but I've considered other things. Like, I might have, like, cancer or something, which is God. scary. Well, you know what? But, I just had an ultrasound done today because I think I'm pregnant. No. Oh, well. No, I got an ultrasound done today because I I can't remember if I told you I've had this straining, like uncomfortable feeling right in my groin, and I think I pulled something at work. Oh, hurting a kind of like a couple hundred pound vat of fryer oil that's like 400 degrees. So you have to squat down to pick it up. It's fairly heavy. Uh, you really should. Two people should do it, but I usually do it by myself. But the last time I did that, I think I pulled my stomach muscles. And I also like fucked up like something in my groin, like the, all the little tubes and pipes down there. Like I've stretched them out or I strained them or did something. So that had yeah. me. Well, let me guess. So was it like not to get too uh, TMI, but was was it like kind of uh, down in the scrot area? Yeah, exactly. It's right there on the side. Yeah. It was around the back, and it kind of like went up to the uh, top of it, like into the the little hose. Almost, almost, almost like a third. Almost like you have a third nut now. Well, no, I mean, but you can feel the strain. Like, if you do certain things, you uh, can strain. But I also used to wear, like, really tight pants because I couldn't find the right fitting pants for a while. And, like, they made these pants, these cargo just, pants. Just, yeah, no, it wasn't that. I mean, it, the waist would be really tight. It's the right size, but certain types and other brands of pants <laughs> would be, like, super tight. And I'd wear it and thinking, okay, well, this is my size. But like, after a while, it'd be, like, the pants would be just digging into my stomach. And I think I cramped or crimped something doing that so i don't know i think just a number of different things well, like at work like kind of fucked me up well, i remember so I, I i used to play football in high school and i remember like a particularly heavy day at the gym you know just like lifting and stuff like that and i was doing like a lot of squats and i pulled something and it literally looked like i grew a third testicle i still kind of have it but i had it looked at and it was just like he just said like a bundle of like kind of veins just sort of got twisted up and knotted up and it's not a big deal. So I'm like, all right. That sounds like you had a hernia when usually something is protruding. That's herniated tissue. It was like a, a bundle of like small, like a small little vascular kind of bundle type thing. I don't know. The doctor said it wasn't a big deal. So I've never, never had it addressed, but it did impress the ladies when they saw the third. <laughs> Just like Benny Hill, where he's peeing behind the tree, but it's really a garden hose, and it's split in two, and the girls think he has two dicks. That guy, that guy would be in jail today. Oh yeah, he, he was fucking. He's, so funny. He's fuck just people a, today. He's people a, today need to fuck off. Fuck off. Like loosen your. I know. Back the days when you just chase chase girls around a around a bedroom in fast motion with funny people music. People like us, they're gonna. Do their bullshit with right now with what they're doing. But you know what? At the end of the day, men are men, women are women, and guys are going to chase women and try and get laid. That's how it's always going to be. Whether the women give it up or not, that's one thing. Whether they do it the right way, okay. But this oh, yeah. is shit that they're, like, making men into these criminals. It's like, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to seek women out and, like, try and mate with them. That's what we do. That's how we propagate. Fuck. It, it, we just stay home now and masturbate. It isn't our... What are we supposed to do? Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, it's it's a tricky one, you know, like, but it is, I mean, it's in, it's in our, uh, it's programmed into us, it's a, kind of a biological, you know, mandate going on, and you know, and it, needs, it needs to be, it needs to be addressed, we need to be able to talk about it, that's for sure, um, it's a topic that, you know, we're, you know, <laughs> We're, we're basically quite chain cane wearing moon boots trying to walk across the rice paper without, you know, ripping it. It's hey, really you know difficult. What? If someone has to say it, it might as well be me because I'm the one who always says it all the time and, like, says what's going on. I mean, I am not a racist. I'm not a sexist. I'm not a homophobe. I don't fucking want anyone to die horribly except for maybe a few <laughs> politicians right now and corporate scumbags. But, I mean, that doesn't set me apart from anybody right now, but. Like, this bullshit where men are just criminals, like, it's got to stop. It's dumb. Like, there are assholes out there who will rape you. Yeah, those guys need to go to jail. But just trying to pursue a girl because you think she's hot, and by pursue, I mean yeah. anything, romantically, whatever. 
That doesn't mean that's women are fine. I'm mean, here to fucking tell you, women are not fucking saints. They will. They're twice as bad. Are they just pretend like they're not? But there, there are times, you know, like where I'll, I'll just see like a woman just minding her own business, you know, wearing headphones, and a guy just comes up and. Well, yeah, like at the gym, like, like there's a girl at the gym. Yeah, that, that's really cute. And I'm like, okay, what if she gets on the treadmill next to me? Like, no, that doesn't mean she wants you to talk to her, even if she does like you. At the gym, it's sacrosanct. You leave people alone. They're working out. They got their phones on. Leave them the fuck alone. They're not there to yeah, get I, th- I think headphones should be just like the 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 tail indicator, you know? Well, it is. Just and like... you can tell. Like the other night at the gym, there was a girl there who was like just oozing out of her fucking clothes. She had these short shorts on, and she was doing all these things on the ground, spreading her legs and bending over. Like, she was clearly was there to show off her junk to everybody who would watch. And, like, it was to the point where you couldn't not look over anybody because it was just, she was just popping out of her shirt. She had these gigantic tits, no bra. And she wasn't that great looking, really, when you got up close. She was like a fake blonde, tons of makeup, really gaudy makeup and blush. I'm like, why the fuck are you coming to the gym looking like a hooker? It's like, it's clear why she's there. Unless she's a stripper and she's on her way to work or coming from work. I don't know. But let's see. It's like, if you don't want guys to look, then, you know, why are you doing that? So there are differences. But. Yeah, I'm kind of, I kind of, I mean, uh, it's, I mean, I, I do have a lot of like, kind of like empathy because I just, I do like, is, you know, on, on one hand, like, it's kind of like when I see like, uh, like there's girl, these female guitar players that are really awesome, right? And uh, we kind of touched on on females and metal and things like that. We you know? did. And it's like, and it's like they're, they're, cool. yeah, so most of them are in there because they kicked ass, right? And, and you know, and it's, I guess it's to me, like, when I get sort of ashamed of, like, the metal scene a little bit, you know, or, like, there's this, this one, uh, her name's Neely Brosh. She's amazing. It's an amazing guitar player, you know, and, and it's like, she's legit like a badass player like she can hold her own against any any dude you know Vi, Betancourt, all those guys you know and I'm thinking okay like she's worked her ass off to get into the scene and be respected and then still you'll see like you know she'll post a video you know of her just shredding on the guitar and there'll be like one or two guys like show us your feet you know and you're like fuck show us your what your feet you know like get these weirdos yeah, I don't know. Dudes are into that kind of thing. Yeah, I'm not in. I don't. I don't particularly. I mean, it's not quite show us your tits, I guess, right? I mean. I know, but in a weird way, it's almost just as creepy. Well, yeah. I mean, it's a little more weird, but still. <laughs> but but uh, to me, I'm just pointing it out as like kind of like kind of where I'm just like ah, you know, you're not helping. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like. Well, that that, and you know what's funny too is like if you think about what women go through on a regular basis just exactly from, heard from girls i know just like anything just going out to get the mail on a daily basis you yeah, log into like, facebook there's like dick pics from guys you don't know trying to fuck you. you're like all i want to do is talk to my friends and check my messages and there's like dick pics from these guys a creepy fucking meathead fucking guys and just stinky jocks and harry toby's fucking bigfoot clones and all this shit and like right right I, I don't, you know, I get it. I that, that, it. that makes the, almost like the overcorrection, makes it understandable at the very least, and, you know, whether it's the right and approach. The woman, of course, you want to look and feel sexy because that's your proclivity, just like a guy, you want to, like, wear a tight shirt. Like, today I had a tight shirt and I had it tucked in. I didn't do it because I'm trying to get girls to look at me. It's just how I feel put together, you know, it's just my thing, and... I okay. guess some girls, by by that same token, wear heels and a skirt or something, and they get sure. scoped out by guys, you know? And then, like uh-huh. I said, at what point is it wrong? Because a guy sees that, and we think, oh, she's beautiful. I guess if uh-huh. we try to talk to her, that's one thing. If you're like, ooh, baby, like howling and hooting, then that's another. Or unsolicited yeah. advances, like like gross ones, you know? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's just, like I said, it's, far, it's that's actually, that's there's, that's a lot of, there's a lot going on there. That's what we were talking about in metal. Like, there was a few shows ago, like, Joe Ben Chabolto, and she is an attractive girl. And a lot of people, of course, like, mention that. But she has been since day one of early grindcore, like, probably the first band I know of to be, to have a female in the band. And they don't make a big deal out of it. She's just there. She just plays and she just does it. And that's awesome. 
and but in a way I, I also like I, I do like the arch enemy stuff like because once again the arch enemy and like ginger um those those other bands that have just a gorgeous i i think they they kind of um almost like the uber feminine aspect of it i think is also pretty cool like like almost like they're they're so feminine you know and they just embrace it like holy and, and so there's something about that, that i think is pretty cool too it's almost like you have the two types of metal chicks you know you have the uh kind of the the one of the guys type chicks you know like the ball thrower you know because she's probably wearing you know she's wearing the high tops and the and the uh denim and all that right but then you have your arch enemies that are just done up to the nines which i don't know i think both are cool i think that's why i think that's what's so cool about women in metal is they kind of they run the gamut from like the just the fierce you know feminine almost feminist kind of icon to just one of the guys to kind of a you know a nymphomaniac harlot kind of look you know the fishnets and the hairspray and it's all cool you know what i mean so uh, anyway um getting not that women in metal was our topic this time but getting back to that for a second there's also a few chicks out there um for one there's like an all-female death metal band or there was called castration it was my friend jill from razorback records yeah and they were that was kind of interesting and and they weren't like the pouty posy kind of hot girls that i i never saw a picture of them actually i, I think i have but they were they were just chicks in the death metal basically is all it was so that was cool and then uh there was a band called nuclear death have you ever heard of them no it's a three-piece band from like arizona and then the singer and bass player is a girl named mary fucking crazy chick and like just the, those lyrics in that band that she wrote they would make cannibal corpus blush they were like so fucking and they were like male or female it was like anything she was fucking way the fuck out there like just crazy crazy fucking shit like oh, there's some good ones man weird bizarre and the band was actually not bad it, it was it was noisy it was like rough but it was really good they were like just fast thrashy death metal mm-hmm and her vocals weren't particularly like growls or anything. They were just her like kind of shouting, like which a lot of early death metal was. This is back in like the 90s, like early 90s. Yeah. And uh, I can't remember what they're doing now. I think she's doing something now. But yeah, it's there's been there's, there's, quite a few there's different a really, women in metal. There's a really excellent kind of newer band um, called Crypta. Don't I know. think you would actually take them. They're kind of blackened thrash death all females uh they just they just put out a, an album on napalm they're excellent and then uh but I, I think it's former members of a band called nervosa from brazil which is a really good uh all-female thrash band see and those yeah, guys are really attractive like that bass player like damn oh they're super delicious yeah they're like but they look they're, like they're I've all heard them but i it looks like they know what they're doing and they don't like do the posy posy shit but they they're good looking you know it's yeah the <laughs> crypt is the same way they're all they're all really attractive but legit like players like legitimately like just holding their own man like see and now and, you and know why this is why i insult so many other bands just off the cuff because guys get away with it because they're not being judged on their looks or the really they're playing in some cases it's just like oh we're guys we play death metal girls are like oh they're fucking ugly but they're good or oh they're not that good but they're hot but they're just pouting and <laughs> it's like you got to be beautiful and talented to be a woman in death metal it's kind of funny it's like well <laughs> yeah. so anyway um we were talking about last week uh, not so much death metal, but Venom. Um, one of the yeah. things you kept talking about is you were talking about why you liked Calm Before the Storm because it had a definite presence of American style guitar playing from mm-hmm. none other than Mike Hickey, who was also on the Carcass Heartwork record. Yeah. I can't remember. I, I can't remember if he was on the record or if he was just on tour with them. I think he might have just been on the tour with them. I think that's what it was. Is he was on the hard work tour because Mike Amott couldn't do it because suddenly Arch Enemy like got big or something. Well, so anyway, Mike yeah, in the Carcass Heartwork uh, 
foundation there for a while. Um, there was something I was listening to our last week's show that I wanted to say about that, but it, I kind of lost it. But uh, Death Metal uh, Venom, yeah, I don't know. It just seems like they reinvented themselves a couple of times, and like they did that with. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess you said it was was it their Cold Lake, the Calm Before the Storm album, which. Yeah. In a way, it could have been, I guess. Um, but I like the guitar playing, the like the harmonic vocal style and all of that they had with the whole band doing backup vocals, you know, like, you should have taken more care. Yeah, yeah. And I actually like that, and I thought it was really different. It was really unique, and it was push Venom in a new direction, but it was fresh and crisp, and it was really good, versus the same old shtick, like, after three albums of just, like, you know, it was like, evil and league with satan and all that shit it was like okay you know three albums and i'm done with it so i'm done yeah. with it. i mean it's just it's getting old they were going to go anywhere and i think uh that record really kind of broke them big in the states too because it was also a distribution deal record that got them more noticed over here but and plus like we talked about z-rock right right a big radio station if you don't know what z-rock is at the time in the 80s everybody there was 87 about right right around there 87 88 there was an internationally um i don't know how they pulled it syndicated. off syndicated yeah it yeah. was a radio station where was it out of la i think so it was um san francisco it was, or was it new york yeah it was eddie trunk i think started it didn't he was it did eddie trunk yeah do that? i think eddie trunk started z-rock if i'm not mistaken I never uh, heard him mention it in all the time I've listened to his radio show. But well, anyways, there was a nationally syndicated radio called radio station called Z Rock, which played for the most part like what we now consider glam and Judas Priest and just regular rock and metal like Iron Maiden. But they also had a thrash hour and stuff like that, like late night Sunday nights. And this is where Venom's Calm Before the Storm kind of came out and got played a lot. It was around that same time. That's where I first heard it. So I heard the song Metal Punk, and you heard the song Deadline. So we both yeah. had exposure to it. Um, and that was... Uh, and even the lyrics, if you really think about it, the lyrics on that record were like more like sexual or just more like metal or it's like tongue-in-cheek. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Or I well, think anyway, it's kind of more of an existential sort of uh, thought process. It's funny that we, we were talking about that and we got on the topic of Whitesnake from the previous show the week before and then Racer X. So I listened to both of those records and I got to say the Racer X one, I uh -huh. could actually see myself. I think if you have that, you should give it to me in Dropbox and let me go through it all the way instead of having to listen to it on the Internet. Because that wasn't okay. bad. It was shreddy. It's not shreddy stuff isn't my forte usually, but it did have like this 80s solid Cut metal it. like blood blue blood metal sound like lots yeah. of crazy guitars and i know you but, like it for the guitar but the thing i noticed was the drums i like the drums on it because it was kind of fast it was kind of heavy well they're amazing and it was it was really fast for that time too and like, it wasn't super produced either but it was still like metal -y, you know it's like this mm -hmm. like definitive metal sound like ripping solos yeah. and the vocals were kind of like what you said like queen's reiki fades warning but not too annoying over the top yeah so oh, I'm glad. yeah because I, I i figured it would kind of be I, I i'm not surprised that you cut you felt that way because it is it's 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 you know and it, it is the guitar riffs too it's not just like shredding solos like if you ask me like the guitar riffs are better are more important than than solos so like if there's good oh, yeah, chunky sure. rhythm guitars and it does have that sort of hollow there's an 80s like Almost like kind of a washy, kind of reverby sound. Is, is that washed? What? That kind of a washy sort of sound that covers the whole music. That's very eighties. It might be over overuse of reverb or something, and it could get annoying. But if it's done just right, it just makes it sound classic. But that album definitely has it. You know, where where the guitars are not too clean, they're a little raw. You know. Almost like they're about to fall yeah, apart. Yeah, so what I was going to say is it wasn't uh, particularly like overproduced, which is what I don't mm -hmm. like about a lot of that stuff from that era. Is unless it's if it's not thrash, it tends to be like super slick and clean and produced. This mm -hmm. one didn't quite have that. It had like that nice, like thicker, a little bit fuzzier, dirtier production. Oh, let's see if I can get it into your Dropbox. Like I, I don't, I don't have it purchased, but I'll buy it for you. You know, so you don't have it. 
Oh, dude, I, 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 I hate to say it. I'm one of those guys that switched over to streaming and pretty much sold off my CD collection. That was a very bad move. You should not have done that. Oh, totally was. It did it like, dude, it was like 10 years ago when I did it. But like, yeah, I mean, could have, should have. Because I had a lot. Of, I had a lot of rare stuff that would probably, <laughs> I could practically retire. I, never, it. I have rare stuff that I don't ever listen to that I despise, but I keep it just because of what it is. You know, I mean, yeah, I know. never get rid I, of anything. I, I've just never been a collector of anything, really. If um, you love metal, you love metal. Come on, man. Yeah, and, uh, you know, maybe I'll get back into it, you know, when I'm in a better spot. You know, I kind of plan on... Maybe oh, and I was gonna say go with the uh, vinyl route, you know, where just buying vinyl. But I wrote some notes down, and uh, also at this Racer X record, it reminded me very heavily of Ingve Malmsteen's first two solo records, which if well, you haven't heard, you need exactly. to hear those. Oh, I have, I have, and that's why I was saying, like, I knew you liked those first couple of Ingve albums. That's why I like Ingve because I don't love guitar shredding, but those first two records of his with Ingve Malmsteen's Rising Force, that band really just like classic personification embodiment of what metal is it's like it's heavy it's it's mm -hmm. got cool subject matter there's like excellent playing it's kind of dark like everything like it's perfect that that record especially the second one marching out i think so that's what racer x reminded me of and it was from that same era like the mid to late 80s when was that 87 or 88 that I, one? Think, I think yeah i think second heat was 88 and then the first one came out in the 86 or 86. I've always seen that record in stores. I, I was I like, ah, Racer X. It, it reminds me of one of those bands like uh, Extreme, you know, one of those that like, you always see, but you never quite know what it is, so you don't ever take it. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. It was like, I know it's not glam, but I know it's not thrash, so I never took a chance on it. And, it was, and at the time, like, I didn't care about regular metal once I discovered thrash. I was like, okay, regular metal, they're all kind of going glam anyway. So, yeah, this is what I want, thrash. So... Mm -hmm. but now right. going in the other direction i listened to the other one you prescribed me to listen to and that would be the white snake self-titled album from that same year yeah 87 that one i gotta say my my judgment stands i didn't like it i don't really care it's just there it's good solid rock i mean to me it's that's yeah. what it is but you're saying the guitar tone guitar tone and i was on youtube and all the comments are john sykes john sykes yeah but the thing I noticed about that one, again, was the drummers. The drums were really tight and really heavy on that record, too, and I did like that. But it was not Tommy Aldridge, which is who I thought it was, because he's in the videos of those albums. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the drummer was Cozy Pal. No, no, it wasn't. It was another guy, I want to say Adrian something. Uh... Not Cozy Pal. Um but they show uh, Tommy Aldridge in the video. Why do they show him? And they and it's well, not because uh, because that that whole that whole lineup on that album like kind of got replaced. It was sort of shitty. Um, like what? When the album was in production or what? After the album was finished, and so he fired John Sykes. Um, David Coverdale. Coverdale, yeah. It's a fucking prick, isn't he? I think I I hate to say it because I love him so much, but he might be. <laughs> yeah. Well, I remember reading an interview with him once, and he was talking shit about Deep Purple, who were also putting out a, who had put out that album Perfect Strangers in 1985, and he was talking shit about them. I'm like, fuck you, asshole! Who the fuck are you? You're some bitch who plays in White Snake, and you have Pantene hair, and you look like an old man. Otherwise, fuck off. Right. Yeah, Ainsley Dunbar. Ainsley Dunbar, that's right. That sounds like a British detective or something, or a fucking British like. Oh, hey, great, great drummer. He's worked with like uh, Zappa, Jeff Beck, Journey, David Bowie, Pat Trevor, Sammy Hagar, UFO. He's been in everybody. So yeah, um, the drums were really heavy on that album, and they really, I think, put that album over a little more than it normally would have because drums weren't quite so focused on at that time. Everything back then was just guitar, 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 pretty boy vocalist, and the videos. That was it. Like with the girls mm -hmm. dancing around. That's kind of how it always was. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I was surprised that the drums were that heavy, and I don't remember it. But like I told you last week, is I had a friend who. Uh, 
who bought that tape at the time I was like extreme grindcore and thrash. And then he just like would put that tape on in the car. And I, I knew all those songs, but I was just like, you know, whatever. It's just that band, you know? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe you need to be like a guitar. Like, I don't know. But you, but you well, know, I mean, like yeah, as a that's, guitar that's player, he... the drums and Racer X and Whitesnake is I'm a drum guy. That's what I hear. And I listen to stuff is not guitar. I hear it. And I like it to be tuned down to stuff. Cause that's the music I like, but if it's other music, I'll notice the drums. And that's another reason why I think Accept is so good is because their bass player is really heavy, but their drummer is heavy and he's fast and he does like this faster stuff that almost gives them a thrash edge in some type, some songs. Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, I, and you knew the drummer for um, Racer X is Scott Travis from Judas Priest. So well, actually, you told me that. And when I was yeah. listening to it, I kind of forgot about that. That's why I was like, oh, man, this drummer is like crazy. And then after like today, I thought about it. I listened to it last night and I, I was like, wait a minute. That's the drummer. That's the guy. Painkiller drummer. Like, holy shit. No yeah. wonder it's so tight. And <laughs> I was like, yeah, he wanted me to listen to it in the first place. And I was like, oh, yeah. I'm like, well, anyway, yeah, I liked it. Did you listen to the, the cover they did of Heart of the Lion? That's not on that record, is it? It is, yeah. It's on second oh, meet. No I, no, I listened to. I can't remember what songs I listened to. It was just like track three or four on or something. And, okay. But yeah, um, Heart of the Lion. That's the Judas Priest mm -hmm. on the the metal pages here. Let me look that up and see just exactly what album that was on, like as a bonus track, because it wasn't like. Oh, that's another thing too. Is uh. We talked about doing an album cover show. Like we should really do that once, because every time I think of Judas Priest, I think of Rockarola and that album cover. It was a Coca-Cola bottle cap, but it said Rockarola, not Coca-Cola, but with the same lettering. Yeah. And I think they got in trouble for that, and they had to change the cover. And that's why you have what you have now, which is like this Frazetta-esque painting of like these demons dropping bombs or something, you know? On a... Which which is weird. Like it doesn't. <laughs> It's a weird cover, like, because it doesn't yeah, really... Nothing to do with the album, yeah, but then neither does, I guess, Rock and Roll makes more sense, but... And also, they changed the cover for Point of Entry, which I think the original one was kind of cool. I love that cover, but then they change it to a fucking Edsel oh, that... tail fin. I'm like, what the fuck? It's, like, airbrushed. I'm like, fuck that. No, we, we should. Yeah, like, album covers would be... That'd be a good show. You know, being a Rush fan, you know, of course, I love, like, Hugh Syme. You know, he did all those... Uh, rush album covers which are always some of my favorites but uh yeah we yeah we'll, we'll hold off on album covers uh you were saying you listen to some venom so you listen to black metal and did you say you listen to cast in stone cast in stone and cast in stone i i like but it was when i compared it to primeval primeval was dare i say just slicker sounding you know and, and its production quality is a little better i think on primeval and I, I like the songs better on Primeval. Uh, there was a little more mixing it up. The uh, Cast in Stone, there was a, a little bit of a punk feel to it. I don't know. It's like they have some like solid songwriting oh. in there. It's like more like heavy metal. Yeah, and and I think really that's... there are some fast songs like uh, not, uh, Raised in Hell and I think Fly of the Hydra. There's a few really fast burners on there, but there's also just some really mid-tempo like you're all gonna die and infectious those are all good songs they're really great yeah. songs the whole thing and there's like 13 songs uh, so there's a bunch of this where they like redo all the classic venom tracks but they do it in that style that really heavy chunky style and i really that's a that's a good album yeah, yeah. And it's original lineup you know what and, and it made me realize i think where venom shines like where they where they're the best is actually the slower like kind of uh, mid-paced songs like um, oh, what was the song that I was that I really liked it was might have been Welcome to Hell on what Cast in Stone yeah yeah the remake is, is that a remake Welcome to Hell Welcome to Hell is uh, their first album and it's a song but they, I think they may have done the remake of that, but there's, unless you're thinking of, hold on a second, let's see here. Oh, I wish I remember which song. Raised in Hell, was that the one, the second song? Maybe it was Manitou, but I, I don't remember. It was it was kind of a slow song, like a Manitou slower. Manitou is a 
where the the chorus is Manitou, and then the double bass. That's Manitou. Is that the one? I think so. I almost want to play it here. So. I'm gonna find it because according to DNR metal pages. No, it wasn't that. It wasn't mad to. It, it, it was a song I, I really liked it because it reminded me of. It's gonna sound like a weird like reference, but it reminded me of Saigon Kick. Do you remember that band? <laughs> I've heard the name. Like it reminds me of their heavier stuff, where it's just kind of this groove, almost like groove metal. It's hard to describe, but no, I mean I, I like it when they actually. My favorite songs on the Carvin Stone album are, are kind of the slower, chuggy kind of things, you know, where it's like, ch -ch -ch -ch, you know, like a kind of mid pace. It, they seem to fall apart a little bit when they go speed metal on that album, it sounds like. Yeah, well, they, uh, I don't know, they kind of started off as just a heavy metal band, really, and they mm -hmm. sort of adopted that motorhead ish kind of speed. And as it went on, I think they tried to get faster and faster, and that's kind of what they did on Calm Before the Storm, but it was washed down a little bit with that American melody, and then you had uh, mm -hmm. everything after that. Like Right after that album is when Tony Dolan came in, Demolition Man, that's the ones yeah. that you and Dustin... There's another one called Temples of Ice that I used to have. It wasn't is it the bad. same singer? Yeah, he's, he's on that, and then... Uh, or no, wait, Temples of Ice and then The Wastelands. That's the one I had. Um, it's called The Wastelands. It's like really obscure. It's like, what? What's this album? And uh, it's just got zero like attention. It was like in Europe only. It's on Under One Flag record label, which is a wait. European label. And uh, The Wastelands, 1992. Yeah, yeah it was, here it is. It was Demolition Man. It wasn't bad, but I mean, I think... I, from what I remember of it, it was kind of like, say, like a tankard caliber of thrash metal. Uh, and at that time, Grindcore was really big. So I was like, yeah, whatever, Venom, you know, uh -huh. didn't quite do it. And then that's why later on, Cast in Stone, it was like, oh, that's that's much better, I think. But um, I, I, I might be, check out some more of that, that Dolan guy because, like, he, he's kind of got that, he really has that sort of almost accept style of vocals except or even like bon scott you know uh sound that really raspy gnarly kind of but melodic vocals so and, and there was some really good guitar playing on on that album as well on primeval anyways like sh like kind of technical stuff mike hickey it's on what primeval it's no I think, so this is what's weird is like they kept it would be like Kronos would leave, and then the other guys would come back. Then Kronos would come back, and the other guys would leave. So Primeval, you had Demolition Man, and Mantis was back on guitar, and some other guy named Al Barnes, whoever the fuck that is, was on there. Yeah, and he's listed as playing rhythm guitars, but if if I'm not mistaken, I mean, Mantis was kind of a shit lead player. But he was the but, guitarist of Venom, so I mean, yeah, they're not there's some really back seat to anybody else. There's some really great solos on that album, like clean, like like technically, you know, pretty pretty tricky solos. Like they don't sound like sloppy, or what I imagine Mantis would sound like as far as his solos go. But I could be wrong. I'm st I'm still I'm still a Venom newbie. Yeah, I don't know. They uh, they're still going. They've had something as recently as 2018, and I know they've split. And for some reason, the revolving door is closed, and now there's two Venoms: Venom Inc. and just Venom. So apparently, Venom as it is is Kronos, and now what's his name? Tony Dolan, Demolition Man, is in Venom Inc. It looks like, and is doing their own thing. Which why like why would he care like clearly venom is not his band so i don't know why he's would be but i think he took uh the drummer with him maybe or I don't know. huh well i mean i don't know like it, it it's one of those things it's like you kind of almost our instincts sort of to sort of if there's two of the same bands you know like when bands split like that they both take the name 
Uh, that might be something to talk about. Like, is it is that necessarily a bad thing? I mean, there's, you know, there's kind of um, maybe ethical things in question, so, like who who has more right to the name. But if if, there, if both bands are if both yeah. bands are awesome, yeah. I look at David Vincent. Mean. He didn't do Morbid Angel. He did that other band. What was that other band? Omnium or something or Ultimus. Oh, yeah, that's it. I mean, it's kind of a generic name, but I mean, it's all star players and musicians. So according to what yeah. I'm looking at here, it's Kronos with whoever the fuck and Venom and Venom Inc. with Demolition Man and Abaddon and Mantis, the guitarist and drummer from Venom. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> and they're on yeah. Splash. They're on a big label like the other like Venom. Venom is on like I've been like on 100 different labels like Spine Farm is the latest one out of Finland. So. But uh, uh, but what do you think about um, David Vincent touring under I Am Morbid, playing, uh, you know, basically his catalog of Morbid Angel songs? Well, I, I say why not? I mean, he wrote some of yeah. those songs. He's been in the band, put in just as much time as everybody else. So I think it's... Sure. I don't know what went on behind closed doors. He's taken the brunt of the hatred for that last album, Illudium Insanus. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and he probably had some input in it more than the others because it does sound more like a Jenna Torturer's record in some spots, but sure, it's not a horrible, horrible thing. But I mean, I always say that it sounds like if he had, if they had done Altars of Madness Part 2, mm -hmm. they would have gotten so much shit like, oh, yeah, it's easy to come back and do that. But if they had done what they did, they'd get shit anyway. So what do you do? You're damned if you do and if you don't. So right but i think it's cool that he's touring and doing those why not he wrote those songs he spent just as much yeah. time in the band as anybody else did and uh if it's true right. that pete sandoval has renounced god and is now playing in that then <laughs> that's even cooler i love that even more and you know and i i hate to say it you know like as much as i love the steve tucker stuff you know morbid angel i i haven't heard a peep out of them you know i don't know what they're up to i would love to see a new album from you know, I'd love to see some more Trey Isaac thought. You know, um, Celtic Frost broke up um, when they did Into the Pandemonium, which was their big, uh, their big concept album, if you will, I guess they had. And this is in the 80s. In, in fact, this is in 87, right around the same time as Calm Before the Storm and all this other stuff, Racer X. So Celtic Frost, who were always pretty avant-garde, kind of abandoned the Black Thrash thing a little more, and they did. They had the breakbeat song on there. They had a cover of Mexican radio and they had a couple of songs with a girl singing with a French like symphony strings. There were songs with French horns and symphonies and stuff like that. It was in operatic vocals. And I thought it was the coolest thing ever. And I remember the Celtic Frost just got their asses handed to them in the press. Like the label hated that record, Noise Records. So they like checked off like all the things they didn't like on that record and put it out as like mainly just like the heavy thrash record. And they like lopped off all the songs. They did a Frank Sinatra cover in the temple in the moonlight. They like, they cut that from it. So the real version of it now has all these other songs on it. And uh, it's such a great album. And then it led to the band imploding, like the stress and pressure of recording and uh, like doing this different unique thing and turning the band in a different direction. It just, they imploded. And that's why he had to like just cut loose and let his hair down, so to speak, and just, do a fuck it kind of album which was cold lake and we have discussed that numerous times and said i think he should have changed the name of the band and not said celtic frost on there but he did what he did but that led to the band kind of splitting after a while like him and martin Ain, the bass player after being together for so many years um they kind of resolved their differences again later but then they just kind of broke up and then they got back together years later and did that monotheist album on century media which came out in 2000 four or five around there and that was pretty good um it just goes to show that whenever you do something different you get shit on by your fans but if you don't do something different they get pissed off because you do the same old thing <laughs> it's just you can't win so that i don't know if venom got shit for calm before the storm i mean that was over in the uk well i don't know you like yeah i mean it's not even that i, I like the the record i mean i i gotta admit you know my my fondness for that album is exaggerated a little bit just to, to get under your skin you know let's not kid ourselves what cold lake yeah yeah well, you, you know. like it though 
but but no it's 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 not awful and and, and i'll tell you the truth I, I don't even think it's that much of a stretch from the other albums you know sonically like there's a little yeah there's a little bit more of like the swagger and everything but like musically his guitar sound is still pretty close you know some of the riffs are still pretty similar like i i don't know it I, th- I think it's it's like another one of those like a uh, swan song you know what i mean like people just write off swan song for carcass when if you listen to it it just to me it sounds like a logical carcass album it's a little different than you know some of the earlier stuff but it it sounds like carcass to me like it, it's not a, a a stretch from swan song to you know even um even like corporal jigsaw quadri you know what i mean like there's I, I think there's enough of a of a common ground between all those albums quandary is a song or uh, what's surgical necroticism. necroticism the short name is necroticism the full name is necroticism descanting the insalubrious <laughs> whatever <laughs> you know kind of kind of when they started to go in a little more almost proggy like a more melodic progressive sort of direction you know what i mean like from then on out, all the way to, to Swan Song, I, th- I think there's a pretty solid thread from from those albums that you can kind of hold on to. And I, th- I and believe it or not, I, I feel the same about Cold Lake. Like I, I think there's still enough of a foot in, you know, Therion that I don't know. I, I think maybe people jump to write it off too quick when sonically there's I think there's still enough. It shares enough of the DNA of the other albums that, that I I think it could actually still be appreciated as a Celtic Frost album, you know, like not even changing the name, you know, I, and I know we talked about that, that, you know, if you're going to go that far out of the way, you know, change the name, but I don't even, I, you know, now the more that I think about it, I think it sounds enough like Celtic Frost that they didn't need to change the name of the band. So I don't know. I think, I think it's much like Swan Song presentation and everything i mean and at that time like you can't you can't even let anybody out like, it's like in the late 80s like the whole glam versus metal thing was like a huge thing for people into metal like or at least for a lot of us i was that way um sure so to have a band that you worshipped you know especially after such an album like two met into the pandemonium uh-huh. Like, I couldn't wait to get the next one. And I was like, oh, man, I can't wait to see what they're going to come up with this time. You know? <laughs> well, and I that, guess, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, the story was, I mean, the natural progression would have been to sound like what Therion did with their first symphonic album. I think that's where Frost was going to go um, had they done that. But they didn't. And uh, instead, I, I remember to this day, like, it was Sound Off Records, the one on State Street. And oh, yeah. 7200 South. I went out there like after school, like uh, I was at the community college. I was like, oh, fuck, yeah. Went there. I saw it. There's like a big blue record with CF on the front. I'm like, okay, well, that's kind of a stupid cover compared to the HR Giger stuff and Hieronymus Bosch, but okay. Mm-hmm. And it's all shiny and flashy. So I pick it up. I'm like, fuck, yeah. I flip it over. There's the band photo. I'm like, what? <laughs> No, and I'm like, no, what if they just kind of look weird, but they still sound good? So I read the song titles. Um, Roses <laughs> without thorns, tease me, please me, juices like wine, cherry orchards, downtown Hanley. I'm like, uh. It is funny they did juices like wine. It's an old Duran Duran song. That's from uh, Hungry Isn't Like it? a Yeah. Hungry oh, like oh, never mind. That's a line from Hungry Like a Wolf. It's about vagina, obviously. So they went sleazy. You know, I'm looking yeah, at that with a guy with his pants unbuttoned. There's Tom with like poofed out hair. They're wearing pink lipstick, white sequin gloves. I'm like, what the fuck? Acid wash jeans. I'm like, no, this can't be. This has got to be a joke. And I sat there in the exact same spot that I was standing in for like. And they're smiling. Like a couple of them are smiling on it. Yeah, they're all smiling. They? And not only that, but the drummer was Stephen Priestley at that time, who was on the first Celtic Frost record, Morbid Tales. He's wearing studs and leather and holding an axe. Here he is with, like, suspenders on and or whatever and just glammy hair. And I was just like, this can't be. It's got to be a joke. Like, what if it's a joke? And, like, it has to be. It can't be. And, like, 
I could not accept it. And like, I was there for like literally like 45 minutes standing in the same spot, looking at that, just like, no, it can't be. And like the guy from the store came over. He's like, bro, are you okay? Did you need some help? And I was like, uh, no. Call someone. I literally, I was, I stood in the same spot holding that for like that long because I could not accept what I was seeing. And I was like, no, it can't be. This can't be. That's like Bathory coming out and like putting out a fucking glam record too, or like a rap album or something. In fact, Bathory actually did something kind of not so great either, not too long after that. Um, Quarthon did a solo album. Quarthon did a solo album under the name Quarthon, and the name of the album was, guess what? Album. Like, yeah, fucking genius there. Like, that didn't tell you what was coming your way. Um, it was just really terrible, just rock music. It was kind of like the Hammerheart style rock, rock but mm. a little less Viking. But there was a song where the music stops and he says, I won't eat pussy again. And I was like, what the fuck? What is this? Oh, yeah. So yeah, that was that was pretty bad, but that wasn't anywhere near as embarrassing as Cold Lake. So, well, I, here's so once again, like I'm gonna I'm gonna predict, much like I did with uh, Swan Song, like Carcass, that it's gonna be one of those albums that after enough time, it's gonna be actually rediscovered. You know, what? with Cold Lake, it's going yeah, to be so man. No, it's it's gonna be looked back on as. It's, it's going to get, like, kind of uh, some newfound, like, respect. and You know, I have to say, I think I should... I have not really heard that record all the way through because of its notoriety, but I feel like I should give it a shot only because it's one of Swan. my musician heroes doing, like, glam, so at least it'd be, like, ugly, heavy yeah. glam. I've heard it is. Cherry Orchards. I've heard that one and a few others. It's that super... Are... That's, that's what I'm saying. It's, like, it's not, like... Dude, it's not polished. Like, it's, well, yeah, it's not that's warrant not or point. poisonous. Point it's, is, it's ugly. It's of who it is and what it is that it's like sacrosanct to avoid it. That, that's why. Well, and it's still dark. It's not about it's, being polished. Like, whatever it is, if he did it, you know, I'm just like, I can't believe he did it and he killed his legacy by doing that. No, um, I, I swear to God, dude. Like, if you put like some satanic like lyrics over some of the stuff off Cold Lake, it would be a Celtic Frost album. Like, I don't like know about classic. that. But it's not like, I mean, it's not that good time. I mean, it's still just like sort of sick, you know, and and and, and raw and, and, and aggressive, you know. But like I said, I, I think people are going to re, uh, re-examine it and, and maybe give it a little more respect than maybe it, it's gotten before. Like, and I, and I think the same for Swan Song, you know. But, you know, I could be wrong. Maybe people will just keep it where it's at and in, in the, uh, well, the abominations of metal. Talk, like Tom Warrior, like squash that record. He doesn't like to talk about it. It has not been re-released like all the other ones have been. Which, um, which, which actually makes me sad because. That's probably going to add to its notoriety, though, probably. But Well, it, and I, I, I feel bad if he, he felt like he had to sort of quash that album. Uh, well, under, saying, under duress okay. from like what you don't understand about him is he never really thought of himself as any kind of icon he's a very modest guy mm-hmm. yeah, he now yeah. knows he's... that what he did was like groundbreaking in metal history not only in frost but in Hellham. so he knows he's a badass now but he, at that time he didn't well, think and... yeah whatever i'm just some dumb guy who did this dumb band no one cares about that I'm like no no really dude. He's like oh no yeah really yeah thanks thanks but really i'm like no you know, everybody's like, no, really, you're a fucking metal god. We worship you. Like, we mm-hmm. love your band. Like, he, he now knows. It's different now. But at that but, time... But I think he obviously had a love for that style of music, though, too. Well, yeah, which, clearly. Which, and and I, th- I, I don't think it's a disingenuous album, that's for sure, either. Like, I think it was coming from a good place. I don't think he was trying to sell out. Like, we all have or, our points, you know. Like, when Iron Maiden toured on the Somewhere in, in Time tour... Mm-hmm. They came with the Vinnie Vincent invasion, which I don't love glam, you know, but I bought that record because I love oh. Kiss. And Vinnie Vincent gave Kiss two of their heaviest records. Those so, albums are great, like, Vinnie man. Vincent's the shit. Like, he can play guitar and he made Kiss into a heavy fucking metal machine with Eric Carr. On I, told you, in the 80s. I told you when I was in fifth grade, uh, we did a talent show lip syncing to a Vinnie Vincent song. Yeah. Substitute. Yeah, man. 
So I bought that tape and like the tape was like really polished, glammy, like rock. And I was like, eh, you know, it's okay. There's a few songs that are pretty good. But when they came with Iron Maiden, I couldn't help but buy a Vinnie Vincent Invasion shirt because I fucking love Kiss. And I was like, oh man, Vinnie Vincent, yeah. And, and my friends at school the next day were like, what the fuck, Vinnie Vincent, are you a poser? I'm like, hey man, it's Kiss. Like, Kiss sucks. Like, fuck you. Kiss rules. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, dude, he's a great player. Like, I, I, I he's undeniable, honestly. Um, I wish he would have done more music, honestly. Like, yeah, you really I, 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 I think I think Kiss just puts like if you if you get on the wrong side of Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley, I think you you're just you just get put through the ringer, man. And and maybe he brought it on himself too. Like, I mean, Paul Stanley, yeah. If you cross Paul, like you're never gonna ever be welcome in Kiss camps ever again. Paul is super 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 offended like by anything you do or say. You gotta absolutely worship Kiss and. Otherwise, well, no, and, offended, fuck you forever. But well, and Vinnie Vincent's mistake was filing filing a lawsuit. You don't, you don't. Well, there was you, a bunch of stuff like that he did. That was just the biggest thing. Of course, money with Kiss. That's also exactly the same. Um, yeah. Gene Simmons, not so much. Gene's buried the hatchet. He's played some shows here and there with Vinnie, but Vinnie Vincent never did anything. He would always organize these yeah. shows and he'd cancel them all the fucking time. Yeah. He'd never no, do. So it. A lot, a, of, a lot of a lot of his problems are are self inflicted for sure. No one wanted to play in a band with him. That's the thing. So when he wanted to do it, no one would do it. And Gene oh, Simmons right. described it best in a Kiss Home video. He said, "Here's a guy with all the talent in the world who could be an amazing rock star, but he'd be hanging himself with one hand while you're handing him the keys to the kingdom in the other hand." And I said, "That that sounds like Vinnie Vincent. That's the no, best I've description heard. you can give." Like I've heard like horror stories of like the recording sessions from uh, who was the drummer? Was it Bobby Rock? Yeah, I've heard and, those uh, stories. Mark Slaughter, where like they would program like, these drums that were like, like a, one beat and yeah. <laughs> he said it was just a, a nightmare. And I'm like, yeah, you right. can't do that. And then he just went ahead and went with whatever he played anyway, like no problem. And... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it would be frustrating, you know. So, I mean, obviously a lot of it was self. He brought it on himself. But it, it is too bad because he was, like, a really incredible, like, original guitar player, you know. Um, and it's really it, strange, too. It appears that he's transitioning into a woman, but he hasn't quite finished that either. So it's really weird. Like, he just does all this. Yeah, and it, and no, it. One could get a, no one could get a straight answer out of that either. Like, no, that was a big deal. Like, I wouldn't care. Just play guitar, goddammit. Well, no one's asked him, I don't think, but it's pretty evident that either he's gotten a little overweight and a little bit more, like, androgynous just naturally, or he's trying to be a mm -hmm. female, but it's not really... No one's addressing the so-called elephant in the room, as Eddie Trunk put it. <laughs> it's yeah. like, yeah, who wants to ask? It's like if you ask a girl if she's pregnant, and it turns out she's just fat, you know? We've all done that one, so... Oh. Yeah. Look at you. JR the hey, massage. Hey, you know what? If you're gonna pick shit with me because I am bald, then you can take some shit about being fat. Sorry. Too bad. You don't get it both ways, you know. That's like my ex-girlfriend. Well, like, oh, like, well, I'm gonna fuck this other guy, but our relationship, uh, it sucked, it was all your fault. But I still want to be a friend. Can you call me? Like, oh, okay, yeah, let's be friends. Now we now we know the source of of the anger. This is where it's all coming from. Oh, <laughs> You know, you have bald privilege. No, I'm just saying this is this is what the woke culture is like. It's like they are like they can say whatever they want, but you can't say anything, or else it'll be up your ass, and like you can go anywhere, do anything anymore with your life. That's ridiculous. That's what I'm saying. Is like, are we really at that point where we're just like getting rid of everybody? And I have to well, say, no, like, I have bands on my record label from around the world where they're not all acting like pussies like this. From a curious yeah. standpoint of looking back on history so of course they sure. might collect memorabilia from world war ii that doesn't mean that they're a nazi or that they hate jews or all this other stuff but as a label yeah. owner where do you draw the line if you put out a band's record but you find out the drummer yeah. like might or might not have said something unsavory then what do you yeah. cancel the band do you cancel the release or do you just let the guy uh, speak for himself but the band is a whole different entity so my take on it is like yeah. this it's like if you if you knew what everybody in your neighborhood or at your work or who comes to your work, if you work in a restaurant like me, if you thought every customer in there, if you could read their mind, 
or you knew what they were about, you probably wouldn't even leave the house because everybody has like these crazy thoughts yeah. about something or other and they just can't control sure. it. So, I had a friend post something, a quote from uh, Conan the Barbarian, right? He said, oh, yeah. the papers of the tree of woe. So my friend posted this. So he decided to do the false of doom thing, you know, James Earl Jones. Yeah, yeah. So he put, contemplate this on the tree of woe. And so underneath that, I replied, crucify him. And of course, last night, a week later, Facebook alerts me that I'm about to get canceled on Facebook if I do that again. <laughs> that's offensive hate speech. I'm like, offensive hate speech to who? Control everybody. They try to. Besides, I don't know. The best quote, of course. Is and that's the, not uh, even what I'm talking about. It's a fucking movie quote. Fucking stupid yeah. Facebook. What, what, what's, dick. what's that famous Conan quote? Like, slaughter your enemies. Uh, what is it? Your enemies. She's then driven before you. Hear the lamentation of the women. Yes. Yeah, that's classic. <laughs> yeah. What is that's another one, dude? I've I've read just about every Conan book. There's there's a little that something you know about me. That question, what is best in life? Your answer, you'd be like the other guy. Oh, the wind in your hair, a falcon at your breast, a noble steed to ride. Wrong. Master Butcher, yeah. what is best in life? Crush your enemies. <laughs> you'd be the guy with the wind in my hair. Yeah. Next, Porno graffiti record, a falcon yeah. at rest. Porno graffiti, man, that's that's classic. But I do love the first uh, the first extreme album, the one right before porno graffiti. That one's a raw. You should check that one out. That one's good. I got a Cut tip. That. Nobody on earth listens to extreme except for you and Dustin Mitchell. Yeah, nonsense. What's that? I don't know. No idea. What is that? You making your own noise album? Yeah, it's uh, uh, it's Mersbo. Uh, <laughs> yes. Do you like noise or industrial of any kind? No, I don't. Well, what about like industrial, like say ministry type, like more rock based industrial? The closest I've ever gotten to sort of enjoying industrial music would be like KMFDM. Well, that's what I mean, like stuff like that. Like, have you ever heard Helios Creed? No, um, Shotgun Messiah put out an industrial album. They were like a hair band, which I loved. And then their final album was called Violent New Breed. And it was an industrial album. It was okay, but it was one of those things. I guess it was their cold lake. Because I was like, you know, wanted to hear some great guitar playing. And instead I got... See, and you talk about Cold Lake should just be accepted, but you're the guy who uses the term, this is their Cold Lake, as if it's their well, water record. Yeah, well, this this would be me. This would be me being you at Sound Off Records going, what the hell happened? You know, <laughs> but it's I, I would say by industrial albums, I, it's probably a great album. Like, I think it's going to be another one that I've heard that one before i think someone let me hear it and b i i can't remember but i do remember um that it was shotgun messiah and i couldn't get past the name i'm like wasn't that like a like one of those third or second or third wave glam bands from the 80s mm -hmm. yeah and they were excellent yeah one of my favorites actually but you haven't heard helios creed because they're a guitar based band they're like basically like space rock it's like this noisy rock music it's kind of heavy but there's like a crunchy like really crunchy noisy kind of feedbacky sound they do and it's like mostly cosmic stuff a lot it's really mm. good stuff i mean i i think you might like it and he helios creed the guy is the guitarist from a band called Chrome, who are like a really avant-garde kind of industrial band. They would have like 10-minute songs of like the same riff over and over, like these really weird, like space-sounding like songs that were kind of rock-based. It was the kind of thing you'd see in a science fiction movie where people are like in a bar, like all oh. drinking in a bar. It's like it's really different. I think you might like it. You should. Uh, I'll have to send you some at some point and see what you think. I, I may I may check out some Helios Creed. Maybe I'll do because you're so open-minded. You're such an open-minded guy. I'm not, though. You're but not? not really. I don't I don't think anybody really is. Like life's too short to be open-minded in some sense. That's... You know, you gotta you gotta find what you like and, and uh, cling to it. Well, I have done that. No one can say I haven't done that. 
no, no, you're the, you're the real deal, man. <laughs> All right, dude. Well, hey, should we wrap it? So what did we actually talk about there? Nothing really, right? Uh, yeah, you know, Seinfeld. It was a show about nothing. Yeah. Why not? We have to do some Seinfeld bits every now and then now. What is the deal with Cold Lake? Cold what Lake, Jerry. Cold Lake. The guy <laughs> comes out. He's doing black thrash. All of a sudden, he's over here wearing pink lipstick. Who is this Jerry, guy? Jerry, What's he doing? Don't Oh, Cold Lake. Uh, Cold Lake, Jerry. Jerry, Cold Lake. I can't. <laughs> Cold Lake, Jerry. <laughs> then, I, uh, let's see what Kramer says. Hello, Burzum. Kramer, look at this Cold Lake album cover. No. You <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah, man. Have a lean, grab your I, lipstick and your poofy hair. Go, I hate this hair. I hate this Cold Lake album. Throws it out the window. Um, yeah, man. Hello, Jerry. Hello, David Coverdale. <laughs> oh, man. God All damn. Right. That was a good one. Wow. <laughs>